We meditate because the mind needs to be developed, or the good qualities in the mind need to be developed. The word for meditation in Pali Bhavana means literally that, development, bringing things into being, or taking what's already there and strengthening it. Mindfulness, alertness, concentration, discernment, these are all things we have to some extent. And what we're doing is learning how to take what we've got to appreciate the good things we've got in the mind. and improve the conditions for their growing. Because it's not the case that the mind is innately good or innately bad. It's got good qualities and bad qualities all mixed up together. And the more delusion we have about what's good and what's bad, the harder it is to figure out what needs to be developed and what needs to be abandoned. So we need to develop this quality of learning how to ferret out what's skillful and what's not. And on the one hand, it helps to have instruction from outside to point us in directions where we should look. But that instruction has to be proven in our own practice. In other words, just because it comes in a text or they say the Buddha said this or whoever said it doesn't necessarily mean that it's true, but it does mean that it's something you want to look into. You want to test for yourself, and you want to develop the qualities of mind that make you reliable in evaluating the test. This is where we begin with mindfulness, alertness, concentration. These are the qualities that make you a steady observer, a more reliable observer. Because you're looking for cause and effect, and in some cases the effects come immediately on the causes. It's when you stick your finger into a fire, it immediately hurts, you can immediately pull it out. In other cases, the effects take time. That's when people begin to notice after they've been meditating it. Something I hadn't noticed for quite a while, that the mind is getting calmer. It doesn't react in the ways that it used to. But sometimes you don't notice that for weeks. So to see cause and effect clearly, you have to learn how to be steady in your powers of observation. So you want to focus your mind on something that's steadily there. You've got the breath coming in going out. As long as you're alive, it's going to be coming in going out. So it's a good place to start. You focus on the breath coming in, you focus on it coming out. And after a while you realize in order to stay with the breath, it's going to have to be comfortable. It has to be something you like, something you enjoy doing. Otherwise you get bored and start wandering off to other places. So you hold that purpose in mind. You're going to explore the sensation of breathing and try to use your powers of evaluation to see what kind of breathing feels good right now and what kind of breathing feels good over time. And the longer you stay with the breath, the more you realize that there's a lot going on in the breath. It's not just air coming in and out of the through the nose, but there's a flow of energy that goes along with it. And the way you conceive of the breath can help or hinder the process. If you allow it to be a concept simply of energy flowing, you find that the energy flows more freely. So you hold these concepts in mind. That's the mindfulness. And then you try to develop alertness to see what's actually happening with the breath. And then there's the quality of ardency. So you want to do this well. You give it your full attention. And as soon as you sense anything going wrong, you want to correct it. 
in other words, the breath, which seemed to be comfortable for a while, a particular rhythm felt good. After a while, it's not so good anymore. Well, change it. If you sense the mind wandering off, you bring it right back. And then if you notice that you're getting frustrated with the fact that the mind is wandering off so much, you have to remind yourself frustration is not helpful. You're not here to develop frustration. So try to think in other ways. Remind yourself that each time you bring the mind back to the breath, you're actually strengthening your mindfulness. You may not be happy to see how weak your mindfulness is or how many gaps it has, but that's the way it is. As so John Lee once said, when you start to practice, you start seeing your defilements right away. And as long as you accept the fact that this is what everybody has to go through, it's not a sign that you're a particularly bad meditator or a hopeless meditator. It's just where you are. And how many times I've heard people say they can't meditate because their mind won't, won't settle down. It's like saying, well, I can't go to see the doctor because I'm sick. If you're sick, you've got to go see the doctor. That's the only way you're going to get over your illness. In the same way, if you find that the mind won't settle down, that you've got to meditate and learn the patience that's required. This is a good quality to develop. Because the stronger your, your mindfulness, the stronger your alertness, the more you're able to see and understand about your own mind. So you can really put the Buddha's teachings to the test. To see if developing these qualities really does create a greater capacity for happiness, a greater capacity for well-being. And you can see what other qualities you need to develop in the mind. Get a sense of what's working and what's not, and under which conditions certain teachings work and certain teachings don't. Because an important part of the path is balance. Noticing that when the mind is too sluggish, there are times you need to gladden it. As the Buddha says, in terms of the factors of awakening, there are the passive ones and the active ones. In the same way that a fire can either be too weak or too strong. So when the fire is too weak, or you put more fuel on it, you don't cover it with dust and water. But when it's too strong, you don't add more fuel. That's when you use the dust and the water. So it's not that the dust and water are always bad or always good. Whether the fuel is always bad or always good. You have to learn to read the situation and see what's needed. All of these are issues that you have to keep in mind. It's not that simply watching things you'll immediately understand what to do. If that were the case, the Buddha's instructions would be pretty simple. Just watch and you'll understand for yourself and then you can trust yourself. And Everything will be okay. But he realized there's more to it than just that. This is why right view is an important part of the practice. Understanding what suffering is, as the chant just now. It says, don't discern suffering. It sounds kind of strange. Everybody knows that there is suffering. It's one of the most basic facts of existence, the most basic, basic facts of awareness. Being a conscious agent, we're bound to come into pain, suffering, mental suffering, physical pain. These things are just right there. But we don't really discern them. Discern them means understanding. What exactly is the suffering? It's not the physical pain, it's the mental pain. That's the real suffering. And it turns out that the mental pain is not necessary. I mean, the fact that we have a body, there's going to be pains. Once you've been born, you've signed on for aging, illness, and death, even though you don't realize it. It's part of the, the contract. And it's not even in the small print. It's there, written out clear. But we tend to forget that side of the contract.
But that's not the real suffering. The real suffering is the, is the anguish in the mind. And that comes from craving and ignorance. The Buddha defines it as five clinging aggregates, which is a technical term for the fact that we try to feed on the form of the body, feed on our feelings, feed on our perceptions. The way the mind fabricates its thoughts, feed on consciousness in our attempt to find happiness. and It's like feeding on potato chips, thinking that you're going to get healthy. It does offer some sustenance, but not much. And it certainly doesn't clear up the cholesterol in your arteries or lower your blood pressure. And we think this is where we're going to find happiness. And the Buddha says, no, it's actually the fact that you're trying to feed on these things to find happiness. That's the cause of the suffering. This is what he means by not discerning suffering. We see it, we feel it, but we don't really understand it. And so it helps to have some, some of his insights on the matter. It points out areas that we can look into, that we can experiment with, try to understand. So we can see where we're causing the anguish, where we're causing the disappointment, and what we can let go of so we don't have to suffer that, and what we can develop so that we can let go. He says if you're going to feed on anything, feed on the pleasure that comes from a settled and concentrated mind. That's not going to be the end of suffering in and of itself, but it's the way to the end of suffering. We're following a path. As the mind gets more and more still, more and more at ease in the present moment, there will be a, a sense of ease, pleasure, refreshment. And that can give us a lot of sustenance right there, so we don't have to feed in our old ways. The Buddha is giving us health food, good, solid, sustaining food. So ultimately, the mind gets to the point where it doesn't have to feed. It finds a happiness that doesn't depend on conditions at all. That's the goal that he points us to. And it comes through developing these good qualities of the mind. And when the Buddha talks about the good qualities of mind, as I said, some of them are appropriate for some occasions, others are appropriate for others. Mindfulness, he says, is appropriate in all situations. And by here he means that whole cluster of mindfulness, alertness, ardency, the qualities that go into establishing right mindfulness. Because it oversees everything else. And one analogy he talks of mindfulness as being like a charioteer. A charioteer has to know how fast to get the horses going, and if one horse is pulling faster than the others, you have to pull that one back. In other words, the charioteer has to keep things in balance. Another place to compare is mindfulness to a gatekeeper. And a fortress. You know, the fortress is at, a at the frontier of the kingdom, so it has to be very careful, because it might be infiltrated by spies and people's from outside. So the gatekeeper has to be very mindful and alert to keep watch on who's coming in, to let in only the people he knows and to keep out the people he doesn't know. And as the Buddha said, with mindfulness as your gatekeeper, you develop what's skillful and you abandon what's not. Which means that mindfulness has an important function in learning how to be skillful in judging what's skillful and what's not. You bring your full presence of mind as to what's appropriate, what's not appropriate, what needs to be done in terms of the Four Noble Truths. You want to understand suffering, you want to let go of its cause, and you want to develop the path to the end of suffering, the abandoning of its cause, so that you can realize the cessation of suffering. 
those are the duties and activities that we want to keep in mind. So again, you want to be informed so you can judge things in an intelligent way. We're warned against being judgmental, i.e. judging things without really understanding them. Just coming to our quick gut reaction, which even though we may have nerves in our gut, can't really be relied on. You need to educate your gut. You need to educate your mind. So their judgments are, are skillful, appropriate, really do help to understand suffering and to abandon its cause, they really do understand how to develop the path. So certain things you do have to keep in mind. The primary set of principles to keep in mind is what the Buddha called the Four Noble Truths. Suffering, its cause, the cessation of suffering, the path to its cessation. And you will keep in mind the duties appropriate to each, to understand suffering, to abandon its cause, to realize this cessation by developing the path. Those are the things you keep in mind. They use as your standards of judgment. We're sometimes told that mindfulness is non-judgmental, <coughs> non and in and of itself just plain old mindfulness doesn't know what to judge, because plain old mindfulness could keep anything in mind. But when you train it with right view and get it properly established for the right quality so it becomes right mindfulness, then it becomes the crucial factor in learning how to judge things, what's appropriate, what's inappropriate, for any particular time and place. Because it's not just holding standards in mind in a general way. You have to see how do they apply right here, right now given this situation, given this imbalance in the mind, given this imbalance in the body. How do you bring things back into balance? And the same principle applies in dealing with other people. When you need to tell one person to turn right, you need to tell another person to turn left. There's a famous example of a John Cha. One of his students once accused him of being inconsistent in his instructions. And as he said, sometimes he sees a person walking down the path and the person's wandering off to the right side. You have to say, go left, go left. Another person's wandering off to the left side. And you have to say, go right, go right. The words differ, but the intent is the same or comes to the same thing. That's another principle you keep in mind that you have to read the situation before you know what to apply. And again, so that your, your judgment, your powers of judgment are well informed. You've got good standards of judgment. So it's in this way that mindfulness is an important part of the faculty of judgment. But it has to be informed by the other factors of the path, in particular right view. What makes it right? Because it works. How well does it work? Well, it work depends on your own powers of mindfulness, your own powers of concentration as you develop your own discernment. The Buddha gives standards for judgment. He also gives us standards for judging when the results are really reliable or not. But it's up to us to develop those qualities of mind that allow us to judge for ourselves. Because the Buddha knew he was in a position where he couldn't tell people what to do against their will, and he couldn't prove his points. After all, he talks about nirvana. Where is it? Where do you see it? That's not anything he could point to. But what he did depend on was the fact that people are suffering and they want a way to know a way to put an end to suffering. He's offering that to them, saying, if you want to find an end to suffering, this is what you can do.
and he was so confident that he'd found the right way that he didn't put, try to put any constraints on other people as to whether they had to believe him or not. But it is up to us to develop the powers where we can legitimately judge how accurate his teachings were, how effective they are. This is what we're working on as we meditate, developing the mindfulness, the alertness, the ardency and intentness, the concentration and discernment, the steadiness of mind. all the qualities that put us in a position where we can make accurate judgments for ourselves. <laughs>